In preparation for this Sunday talk, I sometimes will uh, grab any book that's handy that has anything to do with Buddhism just to come up with an idea. Because, you know, I have to come up with a lot of ideas over the years. And I know once in a while I repeat myself, if only once in a while. Um, last Sunday we had a new person here. And um, so it was, a, it was a very informal situation because everybody attended the workshop, of course, stayed home on Sunday, which is pretty, that's pretty normal, uh, having spent the whole day here. And so because um, of just the people over here, I said, well, do you have any questions? And uh, what came up was, yeah, can you say something about ego? I, uh, so I, I commenced to talk about ego. Well, this morning, <clears throat> I was looking at the sayings and doings of the great Master Chao Chu. And... Um, not being in a very Zen mood with my cup of coffee, I was going through here looking for some, some thing he had said that would uh, give a little hook, you know, like in a good newspaper story, draw people into what was being said. And there wasn't a whole lot of that, because Chao Chu was a, a very active teacher, but he was not a particularly um, sophisticated one. He didn't go out of his way to be cute. And so... Page after page, I'm reading about these encounters with him and his students, and it's just coming across like everyday stuff. Nothing spectacular. Even when I came to the Moo story, as it was recounted in there, it just didn't have any pizzazz. And so I, after about ten pages of looking for inspiration, I put the book away and thought, hmm, well... Maybe today is just not a good day to look at that book. But then I let it cook a little bit. And this issue of ego, we don't talk about it much now, but there was a period of time, and it was that period of time when Zen was uh, becoming very popular in this country, that ego was talked about all the time. Um, probably way too much. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do we mean to start with when we talk about ego? Well, we have the standard dictionary version of ego, um, where Freud went and divided the, the mind and its workings into these different uh, compartments. And uh, ego is kind of like who we are as the world sees us and kind of as we perceive us and how healthy is that. And, and therein lies the problem. Because when we talk about somebody's ego being too big, we usually capitalize the E. And when we talk about their ego as being too small, we still capitalize the E. And we talk about it as if it's a tangible, except it's not a tangible. It is simply the way a person looks at themselves. Now, lots of people could argue with that. They say, well, I don't, you know, I don't spend all my time looking at myself. I don't think about myself. I'm not self-absorbed. Uh, so how can you say that my, you know, I, I do that? Well, everybody does that. We do it so much that we don't even think about doing it. But we all have an idea of who we are. And at the workshop for a koan, I gave you the little koan, who are you? And then you're going to respond, I am, or something in that form. Well, it was a good workshop, and we had a lot of different answers. And those answers were pretty much real, and they're doorways into who you are, because it's an idea. But ideas are incredibly powerful. There's a whole school of Buddhism that says ideas are what reality is. The reality that we walk through on a daily basis, where we interact with people and they interact with us, is all determined by ideas that we carry around. And those ideas are all determined by the perceptions we have. 
And if there were no perceptions, there'd be no ideas, there'd be no reality. And you can have really nice, involved, long conversations about this. But you can't ignore it. And we know that the Buddha taught, almost from the beginning, that we are a, a collection of habits and conditioning. And those habits and conditioning forms who we are. And those habits and conditioning cause the way we think about ourselves. They cause whether we think something's good or bad, destructive or constructive, worthy or unworthy. We are constantly making judgments, constantly challenging. And the young, back in the 60s and 70s, challenged the old, which they defined as over 30, because somewhere around 30, people have a tendency to stop challenging themselves. Up until that time, they, they do a fair amount of that. Um, they get an idea, they get real enthusiastic about it, they go and bother everybody with their idea, particularly their friends and acquaintances. Maybe they become environmentalists. So now they go and harangue everybody that'll stand still about the environment. And they're perceived as an environmentalist. When you say, who is that guy? You say, well, he's an environmentalist. And unless you want to have a really long conversation and have him tell you all the things you've done wrong and all the things we're doing wrong, you better steer clear of him. Or, who is that gal? Well, she's a vegetarian. Oh, glad you warned me because I'm going to go around the long way around with her because I'm on my way to, sto to the store to buy some hamburger meat. And so we have these things that make up who we are and we get confused. We do it and other people do it. We think that that's who we are. And um, you've met them. You've met the old gnarly person that just is... Uh, just seems like they've got an answer for everything. Whether the answer is right or wrong or not is irrelevant. They've got an answer for everything. And they have this real strong opinion. And depending upon how long they've held the opinion, they start getting confused and think everybody else has the opinion. And they've been doing this for so long that maybe deep down they know not everybody has the opinion, but they've learned ways to manipulate people so that they treat them as if they have the opinion, assuming that if I treat you this way, you'll eventually become this way. And so you run across these kind of people who have some perhaps bizarre ideas, like if you drink two gallons of water a day, you'll never get sick. Ever. And you won't get cancer. And you won't get any of the other things that make people sick. And the reason all these people get sick with this is they just don't drink enough water. So if you drank the water, you'd never be sick. And when these people occasionally, once in a while, become sick and somebody challenges them, they go, oh, I must have forgot to drink enough water. And they go through their life believing this, just like there's some people that believe that medicine is really not necessary. And if you were a good person, you'd never be sick which means everybody's a bad person because everybody gets sick. Even if we try to hide it, everybody gets sick. They get a little cold. You know, they get a little bug here and there. They eat some bad food. So this perception of who we are, it, it may have to do with our political beliefs. It may have to do with our environmental beliefs. It may have to do with something distinctive about our lifestyle, like being a vegetarian, being an organic gardener, um, building things only out of certified lumber. This is the latest thing that I'm conscious of, is that uh, renewable wood. We now have companies and organizations that are only building things out of renewable wood, refuse to build it out of wood that is cut but not renewed. Good idea but it becomes a religion. But how about down below that? How about the other things that are in there, the day-to-day -day things? Are you a Republican? Or are you a Democrat? Or are you an Independent? Or do you not really care? Or do you just vote for the guy that you like when it's time to vote? And is there a reason to have a party alliance?
All of these things have very much to do with who we are, and they have very little to do with our ego. Because our ego is about how we perceive ourselves moving through the world. And if we have a weak ego, we have a, a very low self-worth. And supposedly, if we have a very strong ego, we have a very high opinion of ourselves. Now, I always think of this as a scale because I want you to think of somebody you know that has a very high opinion of themselves. A really, really high opinion of themselves. Do you really want to be in a room alone with them? Would you rather go find somebody that didn't have quite as high opinion of themselves? If you had to spend an hour drinking weak lemonade, eating stale cookies, and making conversation, who would you want to be stuck with? person with really high opinion of themselves, or maybe what you call normal. We tend to only notice the exaggerations. The person that hides, the person that goes off in the corner, the person that is never worthy, the person that just never did anything right, has a very low opinion of themselves, has a very fragile ego. And then we have the person, and you've got to understand, at least with my perception of this, people that have high opinion of themselves, very often you, have to, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out why. Because you look at their talents and whatnot, and they don't look that much more extraordinary than anybody else's, but they have this hugely high opinion of themselves. It's not that there's anything you know, intrinsically wrong with them. You just kind of go, well, why does she think that her voice in church is so much better than everybody else's? Doesn't she realize that on that one particular hymn, she invariably goes flat, <laughs> and she always sings louder when she does it because she thinks she can correct it that way? Well, within the practice, one of the things that we work on, trying to stay away from the notion of goal, is to be normal, to be that person that you wouldn't run away from or you wouldn't feel sorry for. And actually, if I asked you the question, who are they, you'd really have to pause because you wouldn't tell me that they were this self-centered, egocentric pain in the neck that was always telling you how good they were. And you also wouldn't become rather sympathetic and perhaps a small tear in your eye where you explain that they'd had a rough childhood and an even rougher adulthood and their family did not appreciate them and nobody really nurtured them and down underneath you felt they were really a good person but and you wished you could help them but you're not quite sure how to do it because by golly how did they get this old and feel that bad about themselves but just think of normal person, where you're not putting qualifiers on them. Dogen Zenji, when he talked about the purposes in, said it was to be normal. That's a pretty, pretty profound statement to me, to be normal. When we talk about ego, now Freud has been challenged in this, the last, this century, the last 20, 30, 40 years. But there's no doubt that his work was really, really important to get you know, people to look at what was going on with the mind. And whether we accept the idea that we can divide the mind into these different categories, because science does that anyway. In psych psychiatry and psychology, they want to be sciences. So they, they have to compartmentalize and they have to label. Even though they can't grab an ego and put it in a box, they have to pretend one exists. But if we just define it as our personal image of who we are, our personal idea of who we are that dictates how we move in society, then we can use that. I remember years ago, it was maybe 20 years ago, uh, maybe a little bit less, when the Mall of Victorville opened up. At that time, I played in the High Desert Symphony, which was a community orchestra. And the first chair, uh, she wasn't the first chair at that time, for the violins, was married to the superintendent 
of the Asperia Unified School District. And uh, <clears throat> they invited, the mall invited, asked for the, our community orchestra to come over and play. And everybody's been to the mall, you know. You know, in that area, that food court where they have a piano and sometimes somebody plays. I haven't heard anybody play in a long time. Maybe they've decided just to be a mall. They used to try to be a little classy, have music once in a while. Um, we got up there and played. And it was pretty fun, you know, to get up there and be surrounded and do a performance. And as we were waiting to get up, they were cutting the tape and talking about how wonderful the mall was going to be. I was sitting at a table with uh, this lady who at the time was the second violin, who later became the first violin. Very nice lady, school teacher, nice personality, very, very talented violinist. And her husband, who I'd never met. And I knew nothing about him. For all intents and purposes, I'd never heard of him. Um, but back in those days, I attempted to be a little more visible. And so I was wrestling with the dilemma of, as I traveled around, how would people know that I was a Buddhist priest? Because the reason why monks and priests and nuns wear the robes they wear is to be <coughs> visible so that people know they're there. And so for a few years, many years actually, in certain situations, I would wear a Roman collar, like an Episcopal priest or a Catholic priest, with a brown shirt, brown robe, brown shirt, Roman collar. Guy must be some kind of minister. <coughs> so I used to perform with this shirt, black suit and shirt. And uh, one of the th interesting things about performing in an orchestra, it's kind of like other organizations wear a uniform. It's hard to know who's more important than the other because everybody's got a black suit on and all the women have black dresses on. And everybody looks the same. And so you don't know who you're supposed to be impressed with. Unless, of course, you see them sitting there and you see the guy playing the violin and he's all the way in the back of the second section. And he's playing big hole notes where everybody else's bow is going up and down frantically. You know, well, maybe they just let him there to be, you know, to be nice to him. But at the time, I didn't think anything about it. We were all a happy little group. We had a lot of fun. Every Tuesday, we played for two and a half, three and a half hours, drank some warm lemonade and ate some cookies the ladies brought and and rehearsed for our performances, and we were all sitting there in our black, the great leveler. And Mr. Haney was sitting there, and he didn't come across as a real people person to me, but he did turn to me and ask me what church I was associated with. And I explained to him that we had recently moved up here had some property we'd been using. We're setting up a retreat center, and that it was uh, a Buddhist retreat center. About 30 minutes went by from the time he asked me that question till the time that we had to get up and perform. It was a unique thing to be sitting next to someone and to be ignored by them for 30 straight minutes. I did reflect on the fact that perhaps I gave the wrong answer. It wasn't what he expected to hear. Later on, I began to work in the school district that Mr. Haney was the superintendent of. And I discovered, actually I already knew it, but I discovered that he was a snob. In other words, he wasn't a normal person. Recently, I read a quote from the Dalai Lama that everybody's impressed with. A little editorializing there, but I get all this stuff that comes here through the mail. And I read this quote, and it said something to the effect of whether a person is a laborer or a beggar or a king or the head of a country, they're all the same to me. And the person that quoted the Dalai Lama, was very impressed with the fact that he treated all people the same. I'm not impressed with that. I would be impressed with the fact that he didn't, 
because that's what exactly what the Buddha taught that we are to learn to do, is to give up our idea of ego and just be normal. And so that we treat all people the same. We treat kings and we treat beggars the same. It's not so easy to do. It's a wonderful test of how far along you are on the path. Do you ever have the notion that you're better than somebody else? If you do, you're not treating them the same as you would treat someone who is important. Mr. Haney felt that he should be treated as if he was important. He was the superintendent of a school district. It's an important job. There's no doubt that it's an important job. It doesn't make him important. What makes him important is how he treats other people. Because being a superintendent is about all about dealing with people. It has very little to do with kids. It has a lot to do with people. In a hierarchical society, which I've yet to see a society that isn't, we sometimes get confused and think that because somebody holds this high position that they're special. What's special is the high position, not the person, just because they hold a high position. Everybody got so discouraged with Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton just was a regular guy that had some glaring personality defects. So who are you? Are you less than the superintendent of a school district? And if you are, why do you think you are? What makes you think that you're not as important as them? Are you better than them? I know a lot of teachers that think they are because they got confused. They confuse the job with who they are. Ego is not your job. Ego is not your talent. Ego is not your skills or your degrees. Ego is who you are. The who you are does not change because you graduate from college. The who you are is how you move through life. Do you treat all people the same? Or do you judge some people to be less than you and some people to be superior? And if you do, does that mean that you're cowed by the great and you ride roughshod over the lessers? Or do you treat all people the same? Dalai Lama did not invent this idea when he said, I treat beggars and workers and laborers and heads of government and kings the same. That's what the Buddha did. And that's what he taught his disciples to do. Treat everyone with respect. Look down on no one. And be cowed by no one. The only coinage we have here is how well we do that. <clears throat> so when I ask you who you are, there is no verbal answer because the minute you start to describe who you are, you just fell off the path. And this is what that great teacher, Chao Chu, was all the time trying to teach his students, is that when you start saying a bunch of words, you get into trouble. And so his dialogues with his students come across as pretty mundane because all he's trying to do is teach them not to keep thinking about themselves. And the minute I say, who are you, and you say, I, you're in trouble. Because the I is a mental fabrication. There is no real I. There only is. So how do you deal with that? You can treat it like a game. That's pretty handy to do. Or you can stop thinking about yourself. But whether you say I am good or you say I am bad, you're still confused. 
If you are reached out and punched me in the nose, it would be a better answer than to say, I'm good. Because you didn't get trapped by the eye. And it's a really huge trap. Last week we had someone here and they brought up the ego and looked at me and asked me if I had a big ego. What a great challenge. Totally unexpected. Almost fell off of this stand here trying to do, deal with that. Because you always have to practice. If you don't practice, you forget. And if you forget, you become deluded. And one day you actually start thinking there is an eye.